So my favorite exhibit at my local science museum is actually a game, it's called Mind Ball. And the setup's very simple, deceptively simple. You've got two people at either end of a long table with a small metal ball between them. And the goal is just to push the ball to the other end of the table and you win. The trick, and there's always a trick, is that you can't use your hands. You have to push the ball with your mind. So what I'm resting my head against there is an EEG monitor. And this is picking up brain activity, alpha and theta waves. This is a signature that your brain kicks off when you're relaxed, when the brain is not trying, when you don't have any particular thoughts. The way the game is set up is the more alpha and theta waves you produce, the more force you exert on the ball. So paradoxically, the way to win at mind ball is to not try to win. You have to out-relax your opponent. And this is actually incredibly difficult. It may seem simple, it's not simple. The uh, first time I played, I had, my eyes were closed. I could hear the ball moving back and forth, and I couldn't resist it. I opened my eyes, and I was winning. The ball was almost all the way to the other end of the table, and I thought to myself, oh, I'm winning. And as soon as I thought that, the ball stopped. <laughs> it's like it heard me and started rolling back toward me, and I closed my eyes again. I was relaxed, relax. I panicked. It didn't, once you lose your cool, it's, it's over. I, I lost very badly that day. Um, what I love about this game is it compresses into the smallest possible space this paradox of how you can try not to try. How can you consciously force yourself to relax when you know that relaxation is the key to success? Now, there are some sub-communities in our culture who are very aware of this tension. So professional athletes, musicians, actors, they all know that they're at their best when they're in the zone, when they're not thinking, when they're just relaxed in what they're doing. And they all live in constant fear of that feeling I had when that metal ball was rolling toward me, the, the choking, right? You start, you start to think too much, you start to worry too much, and you lose it. You lose it entirely. And once you lose it, it's almost impossible to get it back. So this is front and center for athletes, performers, but it also pervades the rest of our lives. So it's not as widely recognized as this paradox, the mind ball paradox is something we experience all the time ourselves. So if you think about insomnia, you have an important meeting the next day, your body's exhausted, you know you can fall asleep if you just relax, but your mind is racing. How do you stop your mind from thinking? How do you shut down your mind? This is, this is the same problem as the mind ball problem. Or if you think about a social situation, so an important interview, a first date, speaking to a thousand people, right? You, the advice people are gonna give you is relax, be yourself. But how do you relax in a situation that's just objectively not relaxing? How do you be yourself if you're not feeling very much like yourself? So this is a pervasive problem. There are, there are millions of situations where we face this paradox, and yet we don't have good language for it. We don't talk about it very much. And I think this is because we live in a society that's really focused on working and striving and trying. So we think that the way to achieve our goals is through effort. And we start very young. So we put four-year-olds in cram classes so they can get into the best kindergartens, so they can get into the best high schools and grow into students who pop Ritalin to stay up all night and get good grades and get good test scores so they can get into the best college, so they can turn into us these relentless multitaskers, 24-7 stream of information, never stopping, even bed is no longer an escape. Most of us fall asleep tightly gripping our smartphones, getting off that last tweet or Facebook like before we collapse into sleep. So we, we were constantly trying, we're constantly striving. This would be okay if it always worked. So if it were the case that the only way to achieve goals that we care about is through striving. Maybe this is just our lot in life. It's a tragic condition of being human. But I'm going to argue that that's not the case. So often striving is in fact counterproductive. It, it doesn't help us. And there are many goals in life, very valuable goals, that can't be achieved through direct striving. So for instance, charisma. If you're trying to be 007, you are not 007. Artistic creativity, writing breakthroughs, it, these have to come. You can't force a breakthrough, it has to come to you unbidden. Uh, love of learning, or really love of any kind, we have a sense that this has to grow naturally out of a situation. You can't force someone to love something. And uh, goals like happiness or fun, having fun, are notoriously resistant to direct pursuit. The harder you try to have fun, the less fun you're gonna have. These are things that, again, have to come to you in this kind of spontaneous way. So if it is the case that, that trying, that making effort is often counterproductive, why don't we realize this more often? And I think this is the result of a kind of philosophical hangover that we're still suffering from. It's caused by people like Immanuel Kant and Descartes, who propagated what I'm gonna call the disembodied myth. So the disembodied myth argues that human excellence, 
So achieving your goals, getting to where you want to be, is always the result of rationality. So you're using rationality to figure out where you want to go and how you're going to get there. You then engage in self-control. You control your emotions, control your body, you force yourself to pursue that goal. And this whole process is accompanied by constant effort. You've got to be making constant effort to make this work. So this is a, it's a myth, and the reason I call it a myth is because our best current understanding of human cognition suggests that, in fact, in fact, our thinking is deeply embodied. So we think in terms of metaphors and images. We, they're not just terms of phrase, we actually think in terms of metaphors. We think with our body. A, a huge bulk of our cognition is tacit, it's implicit. We, do, we know how to do things with our body that our conscious mind could never do. And we're built, this whole body-brain system that we are is built for doing, not for thinking. We're we're designed evolutionarily to move efficiently through the world, not to represent it in some abstract way. So we are embodied, we are this kind of integrated mind-body unit. So where did the disembodied myth come from? And why does it still appeal? There's still a kind of appeal to the concept of mind-body dualism. And there's still a feeling that we have of sometimes being split. So we often experience ourselves as being split in a way that seems to map very well onto mind-body dualism. So we say things like, I had to drag myself out of bed in the morning. And if you think about it, that's kind of a weird phrase. Who's dragging whom? Right? There's only one person in the bed. Uh, what's going on? It's a feeling of struggle. We feel, we often feel this kind of internal struggle between what seems like two different forces in us. And I would su suggest that this is, even though we're integrated mind-body units, there's, there's two modes of cognition that are built into us. And cognitive scientists have a lot of different terms for these, hot versus cold, system one, system two, fast and slow, uh, bottom up, top down. Every cognitive scientist has to invent their own set of terminology for this. But what they all agree is that these systems are designed to work together, they're built to work together, but they're functionally distinct in certain ways. And they're also phenomenologically distinct, so they feel different to us from the inside. So hot cognition, system one, is emotional, it's fast, it's automatic, it's mostly unconscious. So uh, when you're driving and you've been driving your whole life, you know how to shift gears and steer, and that's your hot cognition doing that for you. Cold cognition, system two, is non-emotional, it's slow, it's under executive control, and it's mostly conscious. It's the seat of our consciousness. So if you're learning how to drive for the first time and you have to constantly think about everything you're doing, that's cold cognition in action. So the, these two modes of cognition give us this illusion of mind-body dualism. We associate ourselves with system two because that's the only system we have access to. It's the source of consciousness, it's the seat of our narrative sense of self, the story we tell about ourselves, and so our hot cognition often presents itself to us as alien, as something we need to deal with that's, that's separate from us. Another helpful thing about employing this, this dual system model is it actually gives us a sense of why the mind ball paradox is a paradox. Because you're trying, the thing you're trying to shut down is the thing you're using. When I'm saying to myself, relax, 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 the part of my brain, cold cognition, that's saying relax is actually the part that needs to shut up and stop firing if I'm actually really going to relax. So the, the paradox really falls naturally out of this dual system nature of our cognition. Now, it's a real paradox, and yet in life we manage to get around it. People with insomnia eventually fall asleep, hopefully. Uh, people who are nervous on a first date can sometimes relax into the date, so there are ways around it. And if we're going to be successful, we need to figure out strategies for getting around the paradox. And this is where I find early Chinese philosophy so helpful. So this is my original specialty, early, early Taoism and Confucianism. And what I find helpful about these thinkers is they never went down this disembodied rationality rabbit hole. They've always had, uh, from the very beginning, a very embodied picture of the self that incorporated skills and emotions. And they, they formulated some very important concepts and also some practical strategies that I think can be very helpful. So the first of these concepts I want to talk about is Wu Wei, uh, effortless action. So this is a bit like being in the zone in sports. So it's, a, it's a state where you lose a sense of yourself as an agent, you lose a sense of self-consciousness, and yet everything works out perfectly. You're, you're perfectly efficacious in the world. So for instance, Confucius at age 70 was said to be able to follow his heart's desire and never transgress the bounds. So he was perfectly ritually correct even though he just 
did whatever came into his head. The Taoist text, the Zhuangzi, has these skill stories about butchers and uh, woodcarvers who move through the world with perfect ease. They have this amazing skill because they're in a state of wu-wei. Now, in the text, wu-wei is often described as someone giving up control to a force within them. So sometimes the shun or the spirit, this kind of heavenly force that's inside people. I would argue that from a contemporary perspective, what's going on is the uh, cold mind, cold cognition, is ceding some control to the hot systems. It's, it's still monitoring thing, but it's not in the driver's seat anymore. And so this is what's going on in Wu Wei, is a kind of a melding of cold and hot, but hot is really driving things. Now, in the early Chinese conception, the way in which you get into this state is to give yourself up to something bigger than yourself. So that one hallmark of Wu Wei is absorption. And it's absorption into something that's bigger than you and also something you value. It's something you care about. It's something that, that means something to you. Now, for the early Chinese, this is going to be a religious concept. So these were all religious thinkers. So their concept of what this valued whole is, is theological. So it's the Tao, the cosmic way, the way of the universe. But I think we can still, this idea still makes sense today. And in fact, a lot of us today probably get into Wu Wei through formal religion. A lot of us uh, especially use rituals participating in rituals that we care about and we, that make us feel at home to get into a state of Wu Wei. But it doesn't have to be religious. It could be just any sort of activity with people we care about, playing with children, sharing a meal with friends, um, walking in a landscape that we love and that makes us feel small in a good way, that makes us feel part of something larger than us, or just engaging in activities that we love, especially if we're sharing these activities with other people. Now, this idea of sharing is important. The social aspect of Wu Wei is important. And that brings us to the second concept I want to introduce, this idea of Da, it's pronounced Da in modern Mandarin. Uh, charismatic power is how I would render it. So this is a force that someone who is in Wu Wei emanates. It's kind of force field that you emanate when you're in Wu Wei. And it's what attracts people to you. It, what, it's what makes them want to follow you. It, it's what makes them trust you. And it's the key to success, political, spiritual, personal success for all of the early Chinese thinkers. As you might expect, they, they have a religious story about how Wu Wei and Da uh, fit together. So in their view, when you're in Wu Wei, you're in harmony with the Tao, heaven, who created the Tao, gives you this power, Da, uh, so that you can be successful. And it's kind of like a little gold star you get to say heaven likes you and people will follow you. Um, again, I think we can tell a modern cognitive scientific story about this connection. I think what's going on is Wu Wei and Da uh, are related to trust. They're related to the fact that there are many domains in human life where human cooperation is only possible because of emotional commitments. Trust, love, loyalty. There are lots of cooperative dilemmas that self-interested rational agents, so agents working only with cold cognition can't solve. They can only be solved by throwing yourself in, by being emotionally committed. The problem with this is a very powerful strategy, the commitment strategy, is that it's vulnerable to a certain type of defection, what economists call defection, which is hypocrisy. It's vulnerable to the danger that someone's faking the commitment, and so they're getting all the benefits of the cooperation but not paying any of the costs. I think the solution that human beings have evolved to deal with this is this ability to read hot cognition in other people. We, can, we pay a lot of attention to subtle facial expressions, to body language, that actually are signaling people's cold cognition could be telling us whatever story they want to tell us, but we're looking at their body language to figure out what their hot cognition really feels, what's really going on with them. So I think this explains the connection between spontaneity and trust. We all have a kind of low-tech version of that EEG monitor. We can pick up alpha and theta waves, or the lack of alpha and theta waves in other people. And this is why we like people who are spontaneous. So we're attracted to people who have charisma, have it because we have a feeling that they're not faking it, that what they're saying is really who they are, and that there's no ulter ulterior motives going on in the background. So this connection between trust and spontaneity makes a lot of sense, and it also, interestingly, I think is an example of using the mind ball paradox as a signal, as a hard to fake signal. We know that it's very hard to relax on command, and we also know it's very hard to feel and look genuinely loving on command. So when we see signs of genuineness in other people, we take it as a sign that this is really true, this is telling us something about them, we can trust them. 
So this is one way in which I think engaging with early Chinese thought could be helpful. It gives us really new scientific insights. So this connection between trust and spontaneity is something that's only recently started to be examined in social psychology, social neuroscience, partly because of it being inspired by Chinese thought. Another, maybe more practical way we can engage with Chinese philosophy is they all wanted to be in Uwe, they all wanted to obtain De, so they all had to deal with the paradox, the mind ball paradox or the paradox of Uwe, and they developed various strategies for getting around it, for circumventing it. So Confucius had the carving and polishing strategy. Basically try for a really long time and eventually the trying will fall away and you'll be able to be spontaneous. The first Taoist thinker, Lao Tzu, hated this strategy. He said, no, it's a terrible idea. No carving, go back to the unhewn wood. Stop trying. Uh, reconnect with the basic simplicity that you had before you started to try, and that's how you're gonna get into Wu Wei. The next Confucian, Mencius, actually tried to split the difference. So he said, no, we're born with these sprouts, these moral sprouts. We're born with the potential to be uwe in a morally proper way, and we just have to cultivate it. And we can't try too hard, because we have to water and weed, but you can't pull on your sprouts and try to make them grow faster. That's gonna kill them. So try, but don't try too hard. And then finally, Zhuangzi, the last of the Taoist thinkers, uh, says, don't try, don't not try. <laughs> just relax, make your mind empty, and let the world take over. Let the, the environment actually dictate what you do. Take yourself out of the equation, and that's how you're gonna get into uwe. Now, none of these strategies wins. The history of East Asian religious thought is just a cycle of these strategies. One wins officially, and then the other ones pop up again anyway. And this is because it's a genuine paradox. There's no one solution to it. But I think that it's helpful to know which strategies can be helpful in different uh, situations. So it very much probably depends which strategy is good for you, depends on your situation you're facing, what, what are your barriers to Uwe. It probably depends on life stage, so at early stages of life, probably carving and polishing is more important, and then the letting go comes later after you've developed actual real skills. It probably also depends on innate personality. So if you're an introvert or an extrovert, or you're prone toward uh, liberalism or conservatism, different strategies are gonna appeal to you. It's helpful, though, to have these strategies at our fingertips, as it were, to have a kind of toolbox we can draw upon of different strategies for getting into a state of Uwe. Most broadly, I think this embodied model of the self helps get us, get, get us beyond this idea that everything's about abstract thought. Abstract thought's important, but it's not everything. Embodied imagination, training the emotions is crucial, and not just for children, for all of us. This is, uh, complex problems can only be solved by drawing on embodied cognition, and it's a fragile thing. We can easily drown it out with too many distractions, with too much information, too much stimulus, so we need to figure out ways to create a space for Uwe to happen, to, to make space for spontaneity to arise and not drown it out. So unfortunately, the ancient Chinese fortune cookie is blank. There's no uh, solution to the paradox of Uwe, no money back guarantee. Some people wanted their money back from the book. I <laughs> thought there'd be a little pull out or 10 steps to Uwe. Um, but, so there's no one solution, but I think that actually engaging with early Chinese thought helps us in many ways. It helps us recover a sense of the importance of spontaneity and trust in human life, and it also gives us a sense of our fundamentally embodied nature. Thank you very much.